started uh, studying trees in the field and really looking carefully at different seasons is that um, just like um, birds have different plumages through the year, trees have different, a very different appearance. And there are certain aspects of different species of trees that show up um, just for a few weeks in the spring or fall, some in the winter. And for just a period of a few weeks, um, it'll become very easy to identify a certain species of tree. So in this picture, which was taken in uh, uh, late April in Connecticut a few years ago, the bright green um, mass in the center is a flowering Norway maple, which is an introduced tree that's escaped and is growing wild all over the Northeast. Um, but in the spring, early spring, before most of the leaves come out, they get this spectacular dense covering of brilliant green flowers. And you can spot them from miles away. So for that few weeks in the spring, you can be driving down the road and look a mile or two away and say, oh, there's a Norway maple, which you can't do any other time of year. Um, but there are all kinds of examples like that. In the, the other trees in this picture, um, in the foreground and in the far background, there's a lot of eastern white pine, which is uh, it's the only white pine that's native to the east. And the, all the white pines tend to have these long, graceful, uh, upswept branches. Um, and uh, to the left of the Norway maple and a little bit farther back, the light green um, tree is a flowering sugar maple, which is another, it's native, um, and it flowers at about the same time as the Norway maple, but with a paler color that's also very distinctive, just not quite as flashy. So at the same time that you're identifying Norway maples, you can spot all the sugar maples. Um, I actually discovered as I worked on this project that identifying trees in the summer is more difficult than at other times of year, at least from a distance. Um, they give you lots of clues like this in the spring and some clues in the fall when the leaves change color. Um, and in the winter, from a distance, you can see the, the structure of the twigs a lot better. So even from a distance, you can identify a tree by the, the structure of its branches. In the summer, they're all covered with a mass of green leaves. And if you can't see the shape of the individual leaves, it's very difficult to identify them. So strangely, identifying trees at a distance is uh, very difficult in the summer. Um, now, one of the big differences between trees and birds is, obviously, trees are much easier to approach. So you don't even have to sneak up on them. Um, so a lot of my research was done with a digital camera, just walking around in the woods and grabbing a twig and photographing it um, for reference back in the studio. Um, I even did some, some of the artwork in the book was done by carrying my paints and a stool out into the woods and setting up and doing a painting on the spot, um, which I really wasn't able to do with any of the birds. Um, I switched my medium from, uh, I used uh, gouache, which is opaque watercolor for the bird guide, um, which is very good for capturing the subtle tones and the, the soft textures of bird feathers. But for the trees, I, there's a lot of greens, obviously. Um, greens are very difficult to, uh, to get with gouache, so I switched to acrylic paint, um, which, um, and here's a, uh, a painting of that, that was box elder. Um, so here's the painting, and this, um, that's the, uh, the twig, it's modified some, but that's basically the, the twig that was in the previous photograph. Um, so, um, I used acrylic paints for these, um, and it was, a, it was a very good decision. It took me a couple of years to really get comfortable using acrylic paints, but it just a, it's much easier to get a wide range of greens, really rich, saturated colors. Um, it's easy to make corrections. Um, so the, once I had uh, gotten comfortable with acrylic paint, the, the paintings went along very smoothly. 
Um, one of the issues that I had in the tree guide that was very different from the birds was the question of scale. Um, in the bird guide, I painted, I painted the whole bird every single time. Uh, I painted a whole bird, and the field marks that you needed to use were visible on the image of the entire bird. Um, with the trees, I had planned to include quite a few illustrations of, of whole trees, um, but first of all, I discovered that identifying whole trees in the summer is really difficult. There's not much there that distinguishes them, um, and there's really n very little that you can show in an image two inches high in a field guide that will distinguish an oak from a maple, from a hickory, from an ash. So um, there aren't very many images of whole trees in the book. Then I had to figure out what I was going to illustrate, and I settled on um, uh, close-ups of leaves, twigs, um, and not quite so close-up images of uh, twigs in flower, um, uh, bark. Um, for most species, I included an image of the fruit and uh, leaves with a range of fall color like this. And for quite a few species, an image of the whole tree in winter when the, the pattern of the branches is really uh, um, useful for identification. Um, uh, so that was the uh, um, coming up with the the scale. Dealing with scale was one of the the uh, um, problems that I had to deal with early on, um, and I didn't want to lose sight of the the whole tree. But I think that. Um, in your, as you look at these illustrations, I think you can still, in your mind, sort of put them all together to uh, create, uh, kind of assemble a, a picture in your mind of what the uh, um, what the combination of all these things will look like. Um, and I, let me step back a little bit to the um, uh, one of the things that I found um, frustrating in the field field guides to trees that I had used before. Uh, and there's some really excellent books out there, but almost all of them begin with um, uh, separating the species into those with alternate leaves and those with opposite leaves, which is the, the leaves are arranged, how they're arranged on the twig. Both of these species are uh, alternate. You can see on the, the twigs at the top there, the buds are, they come out on either side of the twig in an alternating pattern. Um, so that's one way to begin by separating the species into two groups. Um, but I think you immediately lose sight of the big picture, of what the rest of the tree looks like. If you see a tree from a distance and something about it catches your eye, um, if the book tells you the first thing you need to know is whether the leaves are opposite or alternate, you have to walk over to it, kind of lay out a twig, and and check it to see what the arrangement of the buds or the leaves is. Um, and then you've lost sight of the whole tree and what, what it was that you thought was really noticeable about it in the first place. Um, so that was really my goal in this, was to create a, a field guide that would, uh, um, that would allow you to um, just wander around, see something interesting, on a tree and flip through the pages of the book looking for a, a picture that matches. Um, uh, now one of the other things I noticed about trees early on in this project was how, um, how much they have been affected by humans, how much our lives and the lives of trees are intertwined. Um, it's easy when you're bird watching to imagine that there are wild and free and sort of uh, a little representatives from the wilderness just passing through our world and uh, oblivious, nearly oblivious to all the things that we've done. Even if you're at the sewage treatment plant <laughs> looking at a pectoral sandpiper or something like that, it still sort of carries the memory of